we're looking at the definite integral where the last lecture we approximated total change given the rate of change. So remember, we're given the derivative and we wanted to figure out how to find the total change. So we did this, we started out by saying, well, we could just find the area of rectangles. And technically what we want to do is we want to decrease the change in T, so the size of the interval, the width of the rectangles, and we want to increase in the number of subintervals, the number of rectangles. Meaning, like if you're taking a reading every two seconds, why not, why not take it every second? Why not take it every half second? Why not take it every quarter second? And so on, till we get to this point here. And once again, when we get to that point, we get to the calculus part. So this area is what we're finding under the rate of change. And that gives me my total change up from my original function. So we can also find area under any curves because what we were doing is we had, we had the example of the cars that were the rate of change graphed a triangle. We had the car traveled as a rectangle. So those are easy, right? Well, we want to find any area. And this is what's called antiderivatives. And we'll get to that, not today, but we'll get to that. So if I have, if T is an hour since the start of a 20 hour period of a bacteria population increases at a rate. So you're not gonna like this part, but you have to get comfortable. They're not gonna give you the prime. They're gonna give you a lower case for my function, but they will tell you this is a rate. So this is the derivative, this is the rate where f of t is in millions of bacteria per hour, because it is a rate, make an underestimate of the total change in the number of bacteria over this period using the change of t equals four hours, and then the change in t equals two hours, because we said we'd get a better estimate if we actually could shorten our intervals. So for the change of t equals four hours, uh, we measure the rate every four hours, and so in a 20-hour period, there'd be five of those, right? 20 hours divided by um, the change of T, four hours, and we'd get five. So what we're looking at is every four hours, then, I would be 0, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, so that's every four hours. How am I getting these values? Well, I'm just simply plugging in 0 into my function. I get 3. I plug in 4 into my function, I get 4.6, remembering that these are a rate, all right? So that gives me the rate that's happening right at the beginning, at hour 4, and so on. And so an underestimate then would be my total change by taking each rate and multiplying it by the time. Well, notice every single time is 4 because my change in time is 4. So I take the first value times 4, the second value times 4, and then I would add all of those up, and I would get an underestimate. If I graph these, can you see that this is an underestimate? A lot of times, if you don't know, students will say, well, what if I don't know if this is an, an underestimate? You either learn a couple of things. You do an over as well, which would mean starting one over at 4.6 and going to 43, and you see which value is smaller. I don't really like that because what if I only want to do an underestimate? So what I tell students, if the function is increasing, and this is, and how do I know it's increasing? It's a parabola. If I know the function's increasing, then I always start at the left value. If the function's decreasing, I would actually start one over. All right, and so increasing function, I can see if I start at zero and I go over to four and go down to get that rectangle, go up to four, go over to eight, come down, go, oh, so where am I at? Eight, <laughs> go over to 12 and come down and so on. So all I'm doing on this step right here is I'm finding the area of each one of these rectangles. Okay, it may not feel like you're doing that, but that's all you're doing. You're taking the width, which each one is four, multiplying it by the height, which the height is simply whatever um, your t value is that you plug into your rate, because this is my actual rate. If I change this to change of t equals two hours, 
then I'm measuring every two hours, two, four, six, eight, who do we appreciate? And then notice I'm taking each one of my values. I'm still having to plug these in to make my table. And then starting at the left, I take each one of these values, multiply them by two. And notice I'm going to stop at 35.4. Okay, I'm not going to do this last one because looking at my underestimate, so my total change, I get 288. And this is a better estimate. Why? Because I have smaller subintervals. Okay, my change of t is smaller. And you can even see by the graph this error, this blank spot in here that's not being accounted for, is getting smaller. Well, how do you get better? Get, make the interval smaller. And notice now this error in here. And so that's kind of the key to this section is to convince you that you, you want to get this interval smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Guess what you want to do? You want to let that interval go to zero. Remember what that's called? A limit. So in other words, we're going to take the limit as our number of rectangles go to infinity, but the width of the rectangles are going to go to zero. And that's what integration is, the last part. We'll touch on it the last part of this lecture, but it actually starts the next section. And so that's what Riemann came along and said, well, it's, it's a dude. Riemann came along and said, well, if you have a rate, remember this is a derivative, and it's con continuous in a particular interval, then I can divide that interval into these subdivisions, <coughs> each of a width change in t. And what happens is I can find my change in t by, this is my length of my interval, and then how many subintervals I want. And based on my endpoints, so in other words, this is like my 0, 4, and so on, I can let these be endpoints of my subdivision. And what Riemann says you can do, you can sum all of those areas of those rectangles. And that's what this is. It's an ugly looking formula, but all it's saying is I'm summing the area of the rectangles. So notice a summation sign, sigma, means to add something up. I'm going to start from my index of 0, and I'm going to go to my number of subintervals minus 1. If you think about it, that's the way the table worked, right? You went 1 back. You didn't go to the last one. This piece right here is the height because that's my actual rate. That's my function, which is my derivative. And then this is my width. So all, of, all this is do, saying is take the height times the width of the first one, the height times the width of the second one, the height times the width, and you keep doing that, well, each one of these are those rectangles. If I choose a left endpoint of each subinterval, then I have my n minus 1. So notice here, if we say left endpoint, if the function's decreasing, this is actually an overestimate. Remember I told you that? If you remember, if it's decreasing and you start at the left, that's an overestimate. If I choose the right endpoint, notice I'm below the function. And notice what changed here. Here I started at 0 and I went 1 less. Here I start 1 over and I go to all the values to the right. And so you can kind of see that here with my endpoint. I didn't start here. I started 1 over. I went up to the function. And I went to the left, drew my rectangle, went to the next one, went to the left, and drew my rectangle, and so on. So a left-hand sum and a right-hand sum, these are just approximations. I mean, Riemann had a great idea um, how to get these areas, but these approximations, again, are just like your over and under estimates. And so how do we improve our approximation? We increase the value of n. In other words, we let n go to infinity. When we do this, you are doing integration. So this is the definition of the definite integral. So what this is saying is if I'm looking at a left-hand sum and I'm doing this same piece right here, which is taking the height times the width, the height of the next rectangle, but I let the number of subintervals, number of rectangles, whatever you want to call them, go to infinity, 
then actually Leibniz said, ah, hey, Riemann, that's, that's a pretty good approximation, but this with my integral symbol, my interval from A to B, this being my derivative, it, when I learn what to do with this, next lecture, this finds exact area. And what's cool about this, notice this is a left-hand sum. Watch this piece right here. Didn't change for a right-hand sum. Remember the right-hand sum? I went from, so left-hand 0 to n minus 1. Um, right-hand sum, 1 to n. That's an i should be a 1. But notice the integral. The integral doesn't care because what's happening is that gap is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter if you start one over or one back. When we do integration, you will get exact values. And that's what we want to get to. We don't want to approximate anymore. We don't want to draw any stinking rectangles because it's a pain, right? But what this will give us is the exact area on a particular interval because this integral is adding up infinitely many values. What's nice about this, we no longer have to worry about rectangles. We can find the area of any shape. And this connects our derivatives because remember I said you typically will not see that prime there. I put it on here to just emphasize, but this is con connecting our derivatives with our antiderivatives. So typically what you see is this piece right here for the fundamental theorem of calculus that we're going to definitely go into in section 5.5. But again, all this means when you see this is find the area underneath the derivative, find the area underneath the derivative from this interval a to b, and you do it by finding its antiderivative and then you plug in those intervals. And so we can always use the rate of change, the derivative of a quantity to estimate the total change. So if we know the initial value, then we can take the initial value plus the change and we can approximate for the next value. So we can estimate the original function from its rate of change, our derivative going backwards. And that's what we're gonna be doing. This is called integration or we find the antiderivative. So in other words, I give you the derivative, you have to figure out what was the original function. And that's what integrating also is, is finding the area under the curves. And we will definitely jump right into that coming up.